And we're back on Yankees Hot Stove with a look at some experimental rule changes being implemented in the minors this season. There will be expanded pitch clock usage, limited attempts and step-offs for pitchers, larger bases, and restrictions on shifts. There will also be automated balls and strikes at some levels. Now, these rules are designed to improve the pace of play, create more action on the field, and reduce player injuries. Now, then in the Atlantic League, which is the premier professional partner league of Major League Baseball, two rules that were previously tested there on a limited basis are returning. There will be a double hook DH adjustment, meaning that a team's DH will be removed if its starting pitcher is taken out of a game before completing five innings. And batters will be able to advance to first base on any pitch not caught in the air by a catcher. Jack, that second one seems very difficult to legislate in some way, shape, or form and keep an eye on. What do you think of those two specific rules? I'm going with a love it on one and a <laughs> loathe it on the other. I love the idea of tying the DH to the starting pitcher. So you're encouraging managers to grind along with that starting pitcher a little bit. He doesn't have it in the fourth inning, but if he can give you four more outs, you maintain your DH. If you lift him, you lose that DH spot. So I like that rule. I think it makes a lot of sense. But much like you, I, I just look at the one about being able to advance at any time as a batter if the catcher doesn't catch the ball. So if there's a 1-0 pitch that's in the dirt, the pitcher just happens to torpedo something into the ground, the, the batter can run to first. Where in the history of baseball has that ever happened? Someone's right. backyard? That, that's just a ridiculous and silly rule. And I think you put batters in awkward spots, Bob. What if you're in the ninth inning of a game and you're a slugging hitter? You know your job is to get on base, you're down by a run, but you're also a guy who could put one over the fence. Well, if on a 1-1 a pitch, the ball trickles away, are you supposed to try and run to first? Yeah. You don't know how far it got away. Are you supposed to stay there and right. try and take a whack at the next pitch? Uh, thumbs down on that second one. All right, let's go expanded to some of the other ones. Obviously, I think by acclamation, people, people want a pitch clock. It just makes sense to speed up the game, and I think some guys in the minors have already gotten used to it that are coming up to the majors. That shouldn't be a problem. What about some of those other ones? I'm in favor of a pitch clock, like you said, because of the pacing, and I think we've seen minor league pitchers come up and continue the pacing they've learned in the minors. I'm actually not a fan of banning the shift. I think that when you are taking away something that has proven to be successful, that you're legislating against teams who have shown intelligence, who have shown the ability to be smart on defense. If a football team overloads on one side because they want to cover those two receivers and put four defensive backs on them, well, it's the offensive job to throw the ball in the other direction. I still believe that when a team is overloading at you on one side, you have options. You have a way to use an inside-out swing. Ted Williams did it way back in the 1940s. Yes, I know he's one of the greatest hitters of all time, <laughs> but I've had discussions about this with Paul O'Neill, and he does believe that you can beat the shift, and he talked about the inside-out swing and kind of directing the ball in the other direction. But oddly enough, Paul does like the idea of banning the shift because he says it takes away way too many hits, and you know how Paul felt <laughs> yeah. on the field when a hit was taken away from him. Could you live with the idea that you have to have two players, uh, fielders, on each side of the bag, but, for example, if your shortstop is playing literally right by second base, could you live with that? We know where most of the hits get stolen from. Right. It's that guy who's kind of playing rover. shallow yeah. right field, that <laughs> rover. So, right, I mean, having... Infielders on both sides of second, Bob, that's the way we all grew up watching baseball and seeing baseball play. So I, I guess in watching the game, that looks the most normal and the purest form of baseball. But again, I think when someone hits upon something that is successful and now you're just pulling it away, that, that bothers me that you're taking away someone's wisdom and something that worked. I want to add a little PS on the pitch clock. Cameron Mabin on the game with Michael Kay today said that he, he didn't like the idea because he liked it when pitchers took extra time. Kind of let him sort of survey the field, see what he might want to do, think ahead. I think it's a great idea if you sort of you know, force the hitter's hand by stepping on the mound, getting ready to throw again. David Cohn wasn't the quickest worker in baseball history, but he was cognizant of being quick because of what Ma Maben just said. He wanted the batter to feel uncomfortable. Cohn actually told me that there were times where he would sprint out to the mound and throw his eight warm-up pitches because he wanted to be standing on the mound with the ball in his glove ready to go 
almost before the batter even got to the box, which not only sort of compelled the batter to speed up, but also sent a little message mentally. I'm not worried about you. I am so eager to face you. I am standing on the mound with the ball in my glove because I know I'm about to get you out. So I do think, though, it comes down to pacing. You and I love baseball. We watch a lot of baseball games together, and sometimes the game drags. So I do think with the clock, you're going to pick up the pace and pick up the rhythm more. Well, last